Welcome, guys. Uh, if you've not been to or not seen the webinar before, uh, my name is Mike. Uh, we've got uh, Dan uh, Lawrence with us as well from the Physio Channel. And uh, we, uh, we've been doing this all the way through lockdown. I've uh, been having a chat on a Monday night. Uh, started off with um, uh, talking about tendons, which is uh, one of the areas that uh, Dan is, uh, is really passionate about and has uh, uh, written a book and a course about. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that was a really good couple of weeks. And then we've kind of branched out into other areas over the last few weeks. And uh, we've really responded to the kind of things that you wanted to uh, you wanted to see and wanted to hear about. So if there are any topics uh, that you would like us to cover, then uh, please pop it in the in the chat box and we'll, we'll be happy to to plan some sessions. Uh, we've just had a uh, well, we've had quite a few chats over the last uh, day or so uh, about um, some plans. So, uh, yeah, it's been. Uh, hopefully um, things that you, uh, you'll you find really beneficial. So uh, we're going to have a chat today about two, uh, two topic areas. Uh, I'm going to have a chat about um, patient communication and uh, then Dan is going to talk about uh, placebos and nocebos. So uh, probably heard of placebos before, but maybe not no, uh, nocebos. So it'd be uh, hopefully of interest uh, to you guys, certainly something that um, that I've read a lot about over the last few years and incorporated into my practice. So I'm looking forward to listening to that one as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, uh, Dan, anything you want to uh, you want to say just to introduce yourself? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, uh, Daniel Lawrence from the Physio Channel, Rock Tech UK. Uh, Mike and I were just chatting before we started. We want to mention a couple of things to you just by way of making you aware of some things that have come up. Uh, today, uh, Simon, one of my colleagues, launched our new Flow Tech website, which I'll put onto the chat in a moment, where we've launched and released these new guns into the UK, which are absolutely fantastic. And um, they're the closest I'll get to treating at the moment is using one of these on myself. And as you can see, they're pretty quiet. I haven't turned the sound off and uh, highly effective as well. So um, there's two different types and they're on the Flow Tech Sport website and then mike we've been chatting as well we've arranged a couple of live stream events with you as well do you want yep. to tell people a bit about those yeah sure so uh this well tomorrow is the final day of our fmt1 course so uh, the taping course that we usually deliver as a cpd uh, course at one day uh, we've split it over uh, several days and uh, done bite-sized chunks and uh, we've been able to then uh, teach a bit of taping technique and we've created our own little Facebook group. Uh, people post their videos of doing the techniques and then I review those and give some feedback and then we do the next session on the next day. So we're, we're looking at running another one of those sessions because it's been really well received. And uh, we're also looking at um, doing a pod course as well. And uh, we've had a, a, a chat, Dan and I, about creating... Um, uh, that the course building the course around so that you guys can teach your patients how to treat themselves uh, and use uh, the online um, online systems so that uh, and I'll, I'll show you how I would do it and then you can then incorporate it into your practice and um, and then your patients will, will provide will, will give them links and codes to things and they'll be able to buy the equipment themselves so that they can treat themselves and you can tell them what to do so uh, we're trying to uh, find a way now for you guys to uh, reconnect with your patients and uh, especially if they're um, predominantly manual therapy so uh, so that they can uh, they can learn the techniques or well, you can learn the techniques and then pass pass that information on to them so uh, look out for those they'll be coming out over the next couple of weeks and um, I think uh, we've got another taping course at the end of the month and then in June the first oh, week of go. June and second week of June we've got taping oh, yes, yes. taping and then pods yeah there we go I'm back yeah, okay so uh, yeah if um, if you're interested in those we'll be posting them on the website soon so uh, you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to join in with those I see a few of you are interested already so that's really good um and uh yeah so uh, uh keep keep an eye out for those and again any other courses that you think um you can use this time to learn things learn new things then uh please let us know and we'll we'll be happy to uh, to where we can we'll be happy to try to put things on for you um no problem at all Brilliant. great 
Cool. So, um, yeah, we're going to uh, um, split the session up. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to do the first bit on patient communication and um, and then Dan's going to follow up with the placebos and no, nocebos. So just wanted to give you a little bit of background on this. So my um, I qualified as a as a teacher back in uh, 2006, 2007, and I used to work in FE and then in HE. So uh, with uh, college courses and then university courses. And uh, when I did my teacher training, um, I uh, uh, we went through certain theories of, of teaching. And then uh, as I um, went through my kind of therapy career, I realized that there was um, some uh, a lot of synergy between the two. And we can uh, where we can learn from the teacher training courses and then Im implement that into into the therapy world as well. So uh, I'm just going to um, get my slides up here. Um, so yeah, uh, well, I usually deliver deliver this on the uh, on our diploma course. We teach a, a diploma course, and we we spend a bit of time talking about patient communication and uh, and how to set up your uh, your consultation session to get um, to get the most out of it, and and for the patient to get the most out of it as well. Uh, so we're going to have a look at the traits of a good teacher. Uh, how to agree goals with, with a patient, uh, knowing who your patient is, and then and then trying to make it make it work and make it uh, memorable for for that individual. So just to let you know beforehand, give you a bit of warning, um, there is an interaction bit coming up. So uh, I need your interaction on the uh, on the chat if that's okay. So uh, get your keyboards ready. Um, I'll give you a little bit of time uh, for uh, to answer these. So. A bad teacher. Okay, let's uh, see what you come back with. Uh, so think of a time when you experienced a really bad teacher. And what I'd like you to pop in the chat is why they were bad. What was bad about them? Okay, so if you want to um, pop some things in that chat box there. So if you experienced a bad teacher, either at, uh, at school or at college, university, uh, why was that uh, particular teacher bad? What were the traits that they had? Um, that uh, you really didn't find um, were be of benefit to you, okay? And uh, whilst you're um, angry generally, <laughs> okay, so we had an angry, an angry teacher, oh dear, uh, not engaged in the content, okay, uh, authoritarian, well, that's a, a good word for this uh, late stage of the day, accused you of cheating, oh, wow, put his fist through a window in anger, read a book uh, whilst glancing up, only uh, to look at the far corner of the classroom, no real interaction. Uh, Dan, out of date, okay, good. Teacher was autocratic, didn't like questions. Oh, wow. Well, this is a clue for us, Dan, about <laughs> how not to be. So this is, this is good. Uh, yeah, uh, disagreeing with other literature and believed only his opinion was right. What a, oh, that's a cracking one. Brilliant. Okay, um, right, let's flip that around then. And uh, what made... You, a good teacher. So who who was the teacher that you remember the most, remember the best? And why did they stand out? Why were why were they so uh, why why do you remember them so much? Okay, what did they do? Again, the traits of uh, of that person. Uh th these these bad teachers are great. Uh reading out slides on Pat, yeah, apologies, I'm doing that now, but I'm trying trying to make it interactive. Uh, friendly and opening for discussion, good, passion, enthusiasm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless you. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah, I'll pop the money in the post. Uh, engaging, inviting into discussion, good at listening, open-minded. Yeah, really good. Teaching in a fun way. Yeah, that's really important. Cool. Okay, good. So th these are the kind of things, when I ask this question, um, they are passionate about their subject. Yeah, really good. So that these are the kind of things that usually come out when we when we think about teachers. And if if you think of our role in um, uh, as a therapist, we have to teach people. We 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 have to try to impart our knowledge onto someone so that they leave that session um, having a better understanding than when they came in. And that's basically the job of a teacher. So where, when you get, when you go to a lesson at school, if you're there for 45 minutes, an hour, that, that teacher has got goals, objectives that they need to meet. And then we need to assess them at the end to make sure that they've been met. Um, and you, you've perfectly, um, shown there that if you've got someone who's uninterested, 
uh, kind of goes through the motions, doesn't engage with people, then they're not very good teachers. OK, and the good teachers are the guys that um, that you, you've just mentioned there um, who engage people and, and are open minded and they want to discuss things. OK. <laughs> and uh, also, thanks, Tom. And uh, if they're good looking, yeah, that, that would help. OK, so, uh, yeah, good, um, good teachers. And that's what we need to be. We need to be those good teachers that are enthusiastic and passionate um, about getting our message across. And uh, and I'll show you ways in a second of how to make sure that you have got that message across, because that, that's the important bit. If you've if you've talked to someone and you've taught and you've taught them, um, then at the end of the session, they should be able to recall or demonstrate what what you've told them. OK, so uh, so you make sure that they've got the message. So when you're setting goals for people, this is uh, just something from Louis Gifford. Uh, if you've not heard of him before, then um, this is the kind of stuff that Dan's going to be uh, going to be talking about. <laughs> Peter, you got no chance. You can learn, Peter. Don't worry. Uh, so uh, th this is basically what a patient usually wants to know. OK, so what's wrong with me? How long is it going to take to get better? Is there anything that I can do so the patient can do to get better? Or is there anything that you can do uh, to uh, or give me to help it? Yeah, that, that's generally what the uh, what the patient wants from a, from a session. Those four key things. Um, this is the top of our form uh, in my clinic. So the first question is, what are your expectations from today? OK, but we want to set that goal right at the beginning um, about what they want to get out of that session. And uh, sometimes they don't know what they want to get. So that's fine. We can we can guide them. Um, but we need to ask the patient. Right. OK. Uh, what by the end of this session, what do you want to leave with? OK. And, there, and then at the end of the session, we refer back to that goal and we say, right, OK, this is what you came in with today. This is what you wanted to do. Have we achieved that? So have you uh, uh, do you have that information that you wanted when you when you first came in? And that's exactly what I would do as a teacher. So I'd have my objectives. These are the agreed goals. And then at the end of the session, I go, right, OK, have we achieved these goals? Have you got what you want? Yeah. So that that's really, really key. Um, where, whereas Louis Giffords are quite broad. This is very specific to the individual. So it's an individualized goal. And that's really important. Um, you also have to know the patient's entry behavior. So what are they coming in with? What kind of baggage are they coming in with? And again, Dan will cover this kind of uh, this kind of stuff with the placebo, nocebo area. So um, what have they Googled beforehand? What what have they got in their mind is wrong with them? Um, and and, uh, and we can ask these questions. Have you had a look online about anything? Are you worried about anything? So we can question it a little bit more to see where their head is at so that we can see what kind of uh, myths we need to bust or the information we need to give across so that they can they can change their mind on things if they need to. Or we can reinforce the fact that they're actually on the right lines. OK, um, have they um, <clears throat> got any experience of this issue um, that they've um, that they've had before? OK. And are they drawing on that uh, previous uh, experience? And that's what's making them the way they are today. And again, Dan will um, uh, uh, cover that in a bit more detail. So in teacher, I mean, th this has been debated and, you know, the people say there aren't learning styles, but um, I, I think there are key things that people respond better to than others okay so what i've done here just kind of created a bit of a table to say right if you're trying to attract uh patients and especially now with websites because that's all we've got or facebook your point of contact your ab um, advertising we uh, website if you only have one type of medium you will only attract one type of the the way that that person learns yeah, so if someone's quite a visual learner, they love loads of videos, they love vlogs, they love webinars like this, then uh, you, you will attract them. And if you put that on your website, they will love it. But if they are an auditory type of learner, and that's the way they like to learn, they will be turned off by that kind of content. Okay, And some people are more read-write, so they actually like the detail and they want a blog or they want instructional details. Okay, And then some people are kinesthetic. And we were just talking about this before the webinar today about creating interactive webinars with patients, open forums with patients. So you can communicate with them online and uh, through li uh, live Facebook and live Instagram. 
Yeah. So if you do, um, if you do all of those things, you'll hit everybody. What we tend to do is do the, th do the things that we like. So I'm a very visual learner. I'm very kinesthetic. I think that's basically why we do our job. Yeah. Um, because that's the kind of thing that we like to do. Uh, and I have to, it, 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 um, pains me to write things. I, do, I, do, I don't like um, writing, uh, you know, um, uh, I had to write a chapter in a book when I was working for the university and it took me five years <laughs> to do and the, the editor was going mad. Um, but that, that kind of stuff I, I, is not where my passion is. I love doing the video content. I love doing this kind of stuff where it's interactive. Okay. And then during an appointment as well, you need to hit all of those different types of learning styles whilst you're with them. So if you think about the way we're operating now, you need to prepare for these sessions. So you need to have videos and diagrams that you can do or you record yourself. Um, obviously, you've got the auditory um, part of, of delivery online, but you might need to have it at your dispos uh, disposal a library of um, that kind of research papers that if you get, you know, th those people who love detail, you, you send them over the research paper. Um, some people will be completely turned off by that, but some people will love it and they want to dig down into the into the detail of what you've talked about. OK, so um, I'm not going to go through them all, but you can obviously see that there are different points in the uh, before they come to see you during the when they come to see you and then afterwards in the follow up where you can hit the different types of learning styles with the different types of medium, okay? So that's just something to, uh, to have a think about. I'm sure most of you do um, uh, most of this already, but there may be a couple of things that you, uh, that you miss out. Um, this, is, this is something that I do uh, quite often on the, uh, on the train the trainer courses as well. So I go through this list of questions. So um, you don't have to answer these, by the way. So what, what is your earliest memory? What were you doing at nine o'clock last Thursday? Can't remember nine o'clock last night. Uh, what were you doing on the second Tuesday of September after the millennium? Now, if you can remember that far back. How many tests did you take before passing your driving test? Six times six, seventh letter of the alphabet. And then what were you doing when the Twin Towers were attacked? Seems like a weird bunch of questions, but there are two questions in there that are the same. Yeah, so what were you doing on the second Tuesday of September after the millennium was September the 11th? And you wouldn't remember if someone said to you, what were you doing on that Tuesday? Yeah. But when someone asks you, what are you doing when the Twin Towers were attacked? You know exactly where you are. And it's because you remember what is meaningful to you and what has an emotion attached to it. So when you're delivering your, uh, your therapy to people, your exercise therapy, um, it has to be meaningful to that individual so that they can remember it. OK, if you're just pulling out sheets of exercise willy nilly and they do, and they have no relevance to that individual, they're not going to remember it and they won't be uh, they won't have an attachment to it. So they're less likely to do it. You need to make sure it's uh, specific for them. So what we can do is when you give someone an exercise okay, and we've made sure that it's meaningful task for that individual, We've got to formatively assess them. So this is another teaching terminology. So you, you f form an opinion of how much someone knows. That's what a formative assessment is. So if you just say to someone, have you got that? Yeah, so you show them an exercise. Have you got that? And they'll just go, yeah, 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 I know what you mean. But they, they say it because they, don't, they often don't want to tell you that they haven't got a clue what you've been talking about and they can't remember. OK, so what you need to say instead is uh, or the, the kind you put it in your own words. But can you teach me how to do that exercise that I've just shown you? OK, and you get them to demonstrate it. And then that shows you that they know what you've told them to do. OK, so why you do and you can question them. Yeah. So then they become the teacher. And if they can teach you, you know that they've got it. Yeah. Um, and then another way of putting it is if I, if I was to ask you to explain what I've just said to you. Uh, to your husband or wife or whoever, how would you explain it to them? Oh, I've gone again. Okay, lucky it's the end. Okay, so uh, yeah, how would you explain it to them? And those are ways that you can formatively assess that what you've told them and what you've shown them has gone on, uh, has gone in and, and they've, um, they've understood it. Okay, that was good timing. 
because Dan, it's over to you, mate. <laughs> brilliant. Thank, thanks, Mike. I was I was really enjoying that, really engaged there. Uh, it's brilliant. So now we're going to move on to have a look at the placebo and nocebos, which happen all the time. We use them all the time. We just need to kind of nail down as to what they are and how we can effectively manage them. So uh, let me just stop this presentation. And I did upload mine, Mike. Where's it gone? Do I need to do it again? Add new slide presentation. Yeah, I can't see anything on my end, All mate. Right, okay, sorry about that, guys. I've got some notes here. I did do it twice. <clears throat> right, I'll just uh, get started here. So the placebo, which is what we start with, is one of the most misunderstood terms in our profession. And I often hear the term from patients, but uh, if I could capture the look on some of my students' faces when I talk to them about the placebo and say that there is a large placebo element to, you know, to what we do uh, within our jobs, because that's where most of our knowledge lies. But there's a huge placebo to many things in medicine. And at the end of my few slides, I actually reference a book that I've just started reading. I've wanted to read it for a while. And it's that one there, which I think the camera's probably turned upside down or something. Uh, it's called Surgery, the Ultimate Placebo. And the idea that surgery is one that is the biggest form of medical placebo out there is something which shocks a lot of people. But I've heard it said by surgeons themselves. And this book is actually written by an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, so it's absolutely fascinating to, um, you know, to hear it from from a surgeon as he talks through the research. But what does a placebo mean to, to us? Well, it's often viewed negatively. And I think from what I've read, that's probably because of the idea that there's some deception involved. When you read medical research where a placebo has been used and patients feel that they have got better, the, the placebo is often thought to be deceiving the patient as they're being told they're receiving a treatment when actually they're not. So even though they find benefits from the placebo, it's seen as a as a form of deception. So I think that's probably where one of the more negative views of the placebo comes from. It's also hard to define. It's not a single thing and people respond to it differently and they may respond. Individual may also respond to it differently at different points in time. In terms of where it came from, one of the earliest researchers was a chap called Henry Knowles Beecher, who identified that World War II combat soldiers didn't ask for as much analgesia as people who were injured in the civilian setting. And that's because for a soldier in combat, an injury could be a thing with a positive outcome because it meant that they were removed from the war zone. It meant that they probably got to see uh, friends and family. It meant that they were taken to safety. So they actually felt safer after having an injury um, compared to in a civilian setting where an injury would be much more dangerous. And that's because the injury would threaten their ability to perform their normal daily functions of threaten their ability to produce an income, for example. So an injury in a civilian setting is very different in terms of outcome to an injury in, in the war setting. And that's one of the earliest studies that that um, led to the idea of a placebo and placebo research. There's many things that a placebo could be, but one of the main mechanisms by which a placebo works is through uh, descending inhibition or the release of endogenous opioids. It's often described as the brain's pharmacy, the brain's natural pharmacy. So a placebo causes a neurological effect and then the neurological effect can then trigger uh, hormonal changes within the body, can trigger descending inhibition and therefore it can, can become much more of a, 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 a stimulus to the endocrine system as well. So the placebo is not just all on our head, although it's very much starts there, it can trigger real biological processes which lead to uh, real identified changes within our body 
which lead to pain relief. And without digressing a bit, uh, without digressing too far, what's fascinating from some of the research I've been looking at is it's also a placebo effect to the immune system. And it's thought that people that have allergic reactions to substances, there may be almost a classical conditioning element to that, whereby the very expectation that they're going to have a reaction could have a real effect on the type of reaction that they have. So that if people feel that they uh, are not going to have a reaction, then they have much less of a reaction. Whereas people, if they if they automatically assume they're going to have a reaction, then they end up having a much bigger inflammatory reaction. So what that's suggesting is the placebo is not only strong enough to uh, neutralize strong pain relief, but the placebo is, is, is a strong enough effect to actually uh, influence our immune system and to influence the inflammatory system as well. So it's pretty powerful, even though it's not uh, still not fully understood, of course. So let's um, turn to the slides here. And as it shows here, uh, I hope you like the um, the pictures there of uh, Mike and myself on the advert. Uh, they've just been done. I've just shaved off my beard, so <laughs> I'm going to have to get a new picture or grow the beard back. And Mike said he wants a beard, but uh, I, I did send you. Yeah. I did it's send you that one, Mike. So you can you can <laughs> chop and change as as you please. <laughs> so the placebo effect uh, is a the perceived therapeutic effect minus the specific therapeutic effect, and this is easiest to look at in medicine because if a patient is given, say, um, I don't know, uh, a stimulus, then the perceived therapeutic effect is uh, how much they feel that stimulus helps them, how much it, it, it elevates the mood, how much it, um, it, it gives them you know, energy, boosts their metabolism, boosts their heart rate, etc. And then if you minus the specific therapeutic effect from the drug, then you have what is essentially the placebo effect. So to do this, you typically have to perform a randomized controlled trial that's blinded as well. So here's an example. Uh, let's just say Mike and I are given some tablets, okay? Why, why am I the one with steroids? <laughs> it's, it's, ra it's random selection, right? <laughs> uh, I've, I've got a placebo, all right, but I think it's a steroid and Mike has a steroid and he knows it's a steroid, all right? So I've got a placebo, but I think it's a steroid because it's a big tablet and Mike's got uh, the Mike's got the same, um, but of course mine has no active ingredients. Mine's a, mine's a blank, uh, whereas Mike's is, um, is the real thing. So Mike, as you see, gets a lot stronger. I also get a bit stronger. Now, of course, I could get stronger just because I'm training. But let's just toy with the idea here that I'm getting stronger because I think that I'm taking steroids. So therefore, if you minus that, um, the, the, the 5%, then the active ingredient accounts for 15% of Mike's gain, whereas the placebo effect for me is 5%. So what that says is that Mike got 15% stronger from the steroid and 5% stronger from the placebo effect. So the very fact that he was taking a steroid and the, and the positive um, expectation that he had led to that extra 5% gain. So I also gained, even though I didn't actually have um, an active ingredient. So comparing two groups and particularly when those two groups as they should be are blinded, you can see uh, what the placebo effect likely is. The placebo effect is always tangled up as well with the active ingredient. So if we're doing a, a massage or, or a manipulation or even some rehabilitation exercise, there are placebo elements and placebo effects occurring, which are hard to disentangle from the core of the exercise or the massage medium that we are delivering. So let's toy around with our experimentation here. And let's say that both Mike and I are given a placebo, but I'm told it's a placebo and Mike is told that his is a steroid. So here we can see that the very fact that he thinks he's taking something active is gonna make him do better than me, even though we're both taking the same tablet. And that's because of many things, including 
his uh, positive expectation around what he's taking. This can apply to exercise. If patients have a positive expectation of an exercise and somebody else has a, a neutral expectation or even a negative expectation, that can have a significant impact on the outcome. So take away the placebos, that could be massage, it could be um, uh, uh, some acupuncture, it could be, as I said, a manipulation or exercise. Then if one person is expecting a positive outcome, they're more likely to get a positive outcome. That is in large the placebo effect. Even if you do the best treatment in the world or offer the person the best exercise, if for some reason they are expecting a negative outcome or just don't have a positive outlook, then it's most likely to have such a significant effect on the outcome that it may actually uh, neutralize the effective treatment that you're trying to put into place. So this is the last um, of, uh, of our studies here, and this introduces the nocebo. Now the nocebo is this, it's what it says, it's the perceived negative effect causing a negative outcome or reducing a positive outcome. So it may, uh, in, it may produce pain, for example, or it may reduce the uh, benefits of uh, a massage or it may reduce the benefits of, of a rehabilitation exercise plan. So here we have Mike and I both taking placebos, except I'm told that it's a muscle relaxant. And Mike's told it's a steroid again. So once again, Mike goes and gets 10% stronger from his training and the placebo effect and his magic power boosting pills. And I've got my placebo, but I actually see uh, a minus. Uh, my strength actually decreases because I think I'm taking these, these muscle relaxants instead of the, the placebos. Now, of course, in reality, it's most likely that I might make some strength gains, but they would be they would be significantly less than Mike's. But I just wanted to highlight the point here that a nocebo effect can uh, can can dampen, can neutralize, or could even send people into that uh, that negative territory as well with um, with expectation. So, uh, Mike, we've got lots of similarities between our presentations tonight. I mean, particularly you mentioned about teacher training and um, FE and HE, which is also the journey that I went through uh, also in 2006. And also in my presentation, I've got some interaction. So this is the journey. This is the journey that all of our patients are likely to take. And we're not always aware of these uh, moments in the patient's journey. So I thought it'd be a good idea to show you and to go through and to ask you in the comments to put down whether you consider them to be uh, nocebos or, or placebos. And let's have a look because these can have an effect on the patient outcome. So let's start in the top corner where there's two people talking to each other. So this is um, one person asking their friend for some advice on who to go and see. So they advise that they should go and see uh, uh, Natalie. I saw Natalie there in the comments. So they're saying, who should I go and see for my bad back? And the others, oh, I went to see Natalie. Yep, uh, she was very good. She helped me. You're completely unaware of this conversation, of course. But is this a placebo or a nocebo at this stage? Well, it's obviously a placebo, but I have met some patients who feel that this is a nocebo. Uh, particularly if they're told about, you know, they went to see somebody and, you know, they really did, you know, vigorously did this or they they hurt me, for example. Um, but most of the time, word of mouth, which leads to you getting a patient, is going to be positive. And if they say something positive and say that they did well with you, do you know what? You've already started treating them. Just think about that for a second. You've already started treating them, even though you haven't met them, because if they've got a positive expectation, then the likelihood of a positive outcome is greatly increased. You know those patients that come to you and they sing your praises before you know before you even start assessing them because you've treated their their their, their husband or their wife or their friends and they're really positive and you know you 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 feel positive about treating them too because they're they're really positive about coming to see you. 
that's not just a nice experience. There's a placebo effect going on there. And don't forget, we've got this um, endogenous opioids being released, this descending inhibition. There's a process going on there in your favor, and of course their favor, which has already started to positively treat the patient uh, before they even come to your clinic. Now, the next one is this, they have to find you. So typically they're gonna have a look and search you up on the website or on Facebook or something like that. So once again, um, your website is an opportunity to deliver uh, some placebo therapy. You firstly want to make sure that you don't have any nocebos on your website. So you want to uh, uh, avoid pictures of people in excruciating pain. You want to avoid pictures of like on the screen there, the crumbling spine. Um, you, you want it to be a, a positive website and one that avoids having lots of people kind of buckled over and bending and grimacing, which is likely to make people experience or feel more pain as they look at those uh, look at those images. But there's also an, a, an ability there on the website to to present a positive picture, to present positive messages, uh, to to give people positive facts as well and positive images, positive text positive videos as well, and maybe even some uh, auditory information that, that makes people feel uh, positive about coming to see you because that is treating the patient. Looking on your website, just what they're exposed to visually, but also perhaps engaging in some more uh, purposeful information on your website is already starting to treat the patient. All right, then they give you a phone call, all right? And let's just say they, they speak to you or to your receptionist, Again, that can have a profound effect. If they phone um, your uh, receptionist or uh, they have a, a, a not great experience on the phone, then if the patient's already anxious or if they start to become a little anxious, it, uh, it can um, uh, perhaps not put them at, as, as at ease as you would like. Now, at the clinic where I used to work, we used to have a car park outside, which is great because parking is is kind of important right if people have to get stressed trying to park to come and see you that's not ideal now i appreciate that this may be an issue but i saw a patient what this may be difficult if you're in the middle of a city or something but i saw a patient once who just had an altercation in um a car park outside uh, i think they'd had a bump or a scrape or something and they had had an argument and they came in and they were visually distressed i could see that 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 they were very um uh, tense from it and it completely upset their whole physiotherapy assessment as as you can imagine but little things can do this as well so if the patient uh is is has a bit of stress triggered or has a, is already anxious and they come into the waiting room and they're presented with um you know again with with pictures of people doubled over in pain or if the receptionist is rude to them I don't know or they, they find it difficult to find you then this can trigger or stimulate parts of the brain for example one part called the amygdala and once this happens it starts to kind of set off this anxiety response and set off the threat systems and Mike was talking earlier about about education you can't educate and it's really difficult to to educate somebody who is in a high heightened state of anxiety and of course pain itself can put people in a heightened state of anxiety so we're doing everything we can to to reduce anxiety or to not trigger anxiety because if a patient comes into us anxious through potentially no fault of our own then they're not going to be receptive to new information and they're not going to be the type of patient that we can educate because their brain is just not uh, operating at that educational level when there's heightened anxiety so um, appearance makes a big difference and you can see on the on the thing there you know our clinics need to uh, have a, a good appearance it, that varies I would suggest you want to kind of go with a positive comforting experience some clinics in my opinion look a bit too clinical and I have a friend who uh, anything that's kind of doctorish or clinical makes his heart rate automatically go up uh, so we want our clinics to 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 reflect what we're trying to do in in our practice as well we want to avoid images and posters of uh, of people that are sort of doubled over in pain and these images of uh, of, of crumbling spines, etc. Because these are nocebos. These types of images, people look at them and they think, oh, gosh, is my spine like that? The doctor gave me an X-ray the other day. This can make people feel more pain. It can make it can make their uh, make them 
more fearful of movement. It can make them less likely to engage in, in rehabilitation. So we want to consciously avoid those types of nocebo. And one of the worst ones I see in clinic is um, uh, in clinics is the, the model of the spine with the little red bit sticking out of the spine to kind of, um, I, I assume it's trying to show like a, a disc protrusion or something. But those type of things we don't really think about because we've been exposed to them for our education and they're just, they don't mean much to us, but to a patient looking at that, they can think, oh gosh, is that what's happening in my spine? That looks terrible. Um, you know, I better not move. I better, uh, you know, really kind of look after my spine. It must be fragile. And then there's us, uh, there's how we present as well. So, unfortunately at the moment it's likely we're we're likely to have to uh, face patients in the near future wearing a mask which um we can't deny just looks uh scary and um uh, just very very medical it uh, depends what type of mask you wear but it's not the sort of mask that allows you to greet a patient with a nice warm smile instead you end up looking a bit like bane <laughs> so these are these are things that unfortunately we have to work with at the moment but how we present to a patient is um is is important and then of course we start to communicate with our patients in our room they may see a certificate see that we're qualified i couldn't resist putting a rock tape certificate there but of course if they see a certificate from your your main qualification then that's the sort of thing that that makes patients feel um you know feel feel at ease however Regardless of the journey they've had coming to see you, once the patient's with you, there's a huge experience to practice placebo-based treatment, okay? The placebo is not a negative thing. You're already, we are already incorporating, incorporating the, the placebo. It makes a huge difference. So if you get the patient moving, you don't movement shame them. You, you help them to move. You don't say they have to move in exactly this way. You get them moving. You, you're positive about the sorts of things that they achieve in the clinic. You build up a good rapport and patient alliance as well. All these things can lead to positive outcomes and lead to a better uh, adherence to the treatment plan um, as you move through as well. So I just wanted to highlight there the very fact that the placebo starts right before their patient even looks at your website before, even when they start to um, ask about you and that therefore if the placebo is incorporated into treatment the patients are almost starting to be treated before they even come and book an appointment with you and then the journey that they have literally the, the the physical journey they have to come and see you everything from traveling to parking to finding you um, all has an influence on the patient you want the patient to arrive with you um, at the very least in a calm state and if possible, uh, in, in, a, in a positive state and ready to learn and ready to be treated. You want to avoid at all costs a patient arriving to see you who has, who has um, received too many nocebos and has been made anxious. N not all of this is, beyond, was, is within our control, of course, but we have a great ability to influence our patients right from when they first start to find out about us um, much, much earlier than, than them actually arriving in our clinic. So I just wanted to go through that journey to um, make people aware that there's opportunities to uh, to treat patients before they actually arrive with us. Now, I've, I've been reading a whole bunch of stuff to do with uh, nocebos and placebos, uh, but I wanted just to put up a couple of things here that I found particularly interesting. So the, men, the message I wanted to get across was avoid nocebos, avoid nocebos, and to practice placebo enhanced therapy because that's what the placebo does it, in, it enhances what we do so this book uh, i've just started reading it's absolutely fascinating surgery is the ultimate placebo um, it's amazing and the idea of surgery being a placebo is because of the ritualistic behavior that surgeons go through which has been linked to the type of ritualistic behavior that shamans go through and once again a surgeon has written this paper that I've put up there called Surgeons and Shamans. And it looks at the link between the ritualistic medical behavior and the ritualistic uh, behavior that shamans go through in order to deliver a treatment and the powerful placebo effect of, of, um, of both of those things. So that, uh, that wraps up uh, my presentation on nocebos and placebos. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Perhaps there's some questions if there are, please send them through.
Thank you, guys. Yeah, we've had, we've had a, a few uh, few comments there, which have been good. Mark Mark has said um, surgeons in the kids ward, where uh, at the I guess in the hospital where where it works, um, uh, they wear wear the masks and have a great uh, placebo effect on the patient. So I guess kind of like in a uh, in a jokey. Uh, kind of way and then meeting the um uh, meeting the sur- uh, surgeon so that it um uh it, it kind of demystifies them and it has uh, i mean that that's something that's gone around in the nhs for a while now but um introducing um who who the person is and and uh, what their job role is and you, you see you see that again and again and again now um it's becoming part of the um part of the way that you're you're treated which is really good um we've uh uh, we often wear, um, uh, I don't do it so much now, but I used to do it with um, just name badges of who, of who you are uh, and what, what your job role is. And uh, so, um, and it just puts people at ease when they know who, the, who they're speaking to. Um, I think we had a comment about the type of mask as well. Yeah, um, I was just following that there. I was yeah. trying to work out Mark, yeah. Mark's comment, which um, must I, I then worked out was in response to Tom's. And that's to do with like Superman and Superwoman masks. Yeah. So, uh, you know, even the mask, you know, the film, the mask with the great yeah. cheesy grin. Maybe yeah. if it was, I guess, uh, I, yeah. I, yeah I would get, it, it depends on the person, doesn't it? I mean, if you, if you have, um, if you deal with kind of, uh, I don't know, pe- people who uh, uh, would find that fun, then, that, then that's great. But if it's, I don't know, if it's a frail, frail old lady coming in, uh, who's never seen you before? I think uh, I think it might scare the uh, scare the heck out of them. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it it depends on the. I guess it depends on who you, who you're seeing and uh, and the kind of relationship you already have with the person. I think um, first impression one. I think you've got to be really careful. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, good going for it. If you know them, then uh, then yeah, yeah, you can definitely have a joke. Um, so, uh, Diane's just said seems to be a conflict gathering pace between evidence-based practice and the art of treating clients. I feel worried that our softer skills may be undervalued. That's a good comment. Yeah, I think um, it's it's a pendulum swinging, isn't it? Because it's uh, and it always does that. You get um, you get a particular paper or. Um, a theme of research that comes out and we all go down one route um, and some people chuck the baby out with the bathwater and forget everything they ever knew um, but I think it's um, it's uh, using everything that you know um, and and putting it all together at different times so you kind of grab a little bit of information from one area a little bit from the new stuff and then and then you mix it and match it depending on who you're seeing as well so it's um, I think you have to you have to do that. Um, it's uh, that there is the problem is with research. It, it doesn't um, rarely tells us what to do. It tells us what what not to do, um, or or uh, not how things work, but how things don't work. So uh, it's uh, but then even then the um, uh, d- depends on how the research was conducted. Whether um, whether we need to uh, revisit those kind of thoughts. It's yeah, it's a, it's a good comment that one. I think um, uh, I've seen it a lot over the over the years with the uh, uh, especially with the the pain neuroscience stuff was um, was quite new and it was poo pooed and then it came um, uh, very very popular and then it swung a bit too far the other way and uh, and and now it's coming coming back a bit. But we're we're using the good bits from uh, that escalation in its use. Uh, so that um, I think everyone's a bit more rounded now, um, mm. what we should be anyway. So that uh, I think that's good. Yeah, I mean, this when people were making comments about the their bad teachers. Um, there's yeah. certainly somebody mentioned about the research and the teacher just preferring to stick to their own opinion and and ignore the research. Uh, I think the research does challenge people's uh, professional opinions and the research. You know true research which is going to change practice does significantly challenge people and uh it just in some respects you know threaten threaten people's um professional standpoints as well and that's where the research into placebos is um is is challenging because it can mm. uh, really challenge the um, you know things that people have do, been doing for years it can challenge the uh, the, the routine and um, cha- challenge people's practices uh, furthermore the, with the issue with researching with placebo is um, uh, ethics as well because there's a huge human ethical 
uh, barrier for doing true placebo research because otherwise there is some significant deception and there's a significant group of patients who are potentially going without treatment that they need yeah. in order to do the placebo research but that is um, is unethical so there's challenges there in the the, the very methodology of um, placebo research as well. There's a good comment there by Beverly as well that um, the uh, therapists at the hospital have uh, included a picture of themselves underneath their name badge because they're wearing masks at the moment. So it shows what they normally look like. I think yeah. that's, a really, that's a really good touch. I like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's nice. a good one. Yeah. Good. Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for that. Um, enjoyed listening to that one. That was really good. Um, so uh, that, that's it for another week. And um, we'll be back next Monday at eight. Uh, uh, if, like we said at the beginning, if there's anything in particular that you want to, you want us to cover, uh, want us to discuss, then uh, please let us know, and we'll be we'll be happy to do that. No problem at all. Yeah. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks for joining us. Good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye.